listless vessels. I'm sure somewhere a mega influencer is screen printing the phrase on t-shirts as we speak. As if being tied for second place with the millennial Slim Shady rapping Vivek Ramaswamy wasn't enough to put a damper on the governor's week, those comments and those two words, listless vessels, have set off a free feeding frenzy in what I finally refer to as Megadonia, and maybe rightfully so, but because they've been taken out of context by many, let's listen to the whole damn thing together. We, we have a strand in our, in our party that views supporting Trump as whether you are um, a, a rhino or not. And so you could be the most conservative person since sliced bread unless you're kissing his rear end, they will somehow call you a rhino. So it's been totally detached from principle and what you actually believe and results. And it's more about, you know, just what faction you happen to do. So there'll be people uh, who are huge Trump supporters, like in Congress, who have like incredibly liberal left wing records that that's really just atrocious. And yet they're viewed as by, by some of these folks as like as like really, really good. Then you have other people, you know, like a Congressman Chip Roy, who's endorsed me, Congressman Thomas Massey. These guys have records of principle fighting the swamp that are second to none. And yet they will be attacked by some of these people and, and called rhinos. Uh, so it's just been totally detached from any type of substance. And ultimately, a movement can't be about the personality of one individual. The movement has got to be about what are you trying to achieve on behalf of the American people? And that's got to be based in principle, uh, because if you're not rooted in principle, uh, if all we are is listless vessels that just supposed to follow, you know, whatever happens to come down the pike on Truth Social every morning, th that's not going to be a durable movement. So when I listen to the whole thing without those rage goggles on, this is what I heard. One, if you're not kissing Trump's butt, you're a rhino, whether you're actually a rhino or not. Two, some of those in Congress who have endorsed him have more liberal voting records, but since they say nice things about Trump, mega supporters still like them. Like, I don't know, just spitballing here, unlimited Ukraine sponsor Lindsey Graham, for example. Three, if we want this America First movement to last, it can't be solely based around one person and loyalty to one person. Is he wrong on any of these counts? I'd say no. I also don't think he called Trump supporters listless vessels. I took it as, if all our movement does is listen to Trump and take whatever he says on Truth Social as gospel, we are doomed to be listless vessels and the movement extinct. That's what I heard. Now, could he have phrased it better? Yeah, no duh, no duh. He needs Trump supporters. He can't win without Trump supporters. We all know that. He's got to walk a very fine line that no other Trump competitor has had to. DeSantis is the only Trump challenger who has been labeled a traitor and labeled a rhino simply for running against Donald Trump. Are the rest of them disloyal? Because not even Mike Pence, of all people, has had to walk that line. You can prefer Trump to DeSantis all day long, but if you liked DeSantis a year ago because of his record and leadership, is it really wise to cast him out now just because he's running against the guy you like better? Food for thought, my friends, just marinated on it for me. Moving on with another theme of Trump and loyalty, my next guest has been swept up in Trump witch hunt number four with this latest indictment out of Fulton County, Georgia. Jenna Ellis, once part of Trump's elite strike force, is facing two counts in the indictment violation of the Georgia RICO Act and solicitation of violation of oath by public officer. But unlike others going down in Trump's ship, the Trump team is reportedly icing her out because she has supported his opponent, Ron DeSantis, in the 2024 Republican primary. Ouch. Jenna Ellis joins me now. Jenna, it's so great to have you joining me. I know that it's probably been a rough week for you. It's probably seemed much longer than a week since that indictment number four came down. Of course, you were wrapped up in it. I know that you can't discuss specifics or strategy or anything like that, but I just want to get a sense of how last Monday felt for you. Were you shocked that you were named in this? Well, I think all of us are really shocked uh, seeing what the government is doing specifically to President Trump, uh, to his lawyers now, but also to conservatives across the country. What we've witnessed through Joe Biden's administration with the weaponization of government against uh, parents for going to school board meetings and being put on domestic terrorism watch list to pastors who are going simply to promote the truth outside of uh, Planned Parenthood abortion clinics and having their homes raided by the FBI. Uh, to my friend James O'Keefe, 
who was also raided by the FBI simply for uh, having a diary that belonged to Ashley Biden. I mean, all of these things, I think, are co a coordinated uh, attack on not only our rule of law and our U.S. Constitution, but specifically against conservatives. So I, I think that this particular indictment is attempting to criminalize the practice of law the right to freedom of speech, to petition the government for redress. And I look forward to, through my lawyers, challenging this every step of the way. I think part of the thing here, too, is drowning people in legal fees. I know that you have your own legal defense fund. It's doing well, but obviously, you know, I know this is going to be very, very expensive. So I think part of the motivation here is to drown people like yourself, Rudy Giuliani, others, and just endless legal fees until you say uncle. And that also is very dangerous for our republic, very dangerous for our entire, entire legislative, judicial, American system. So I want to speak to that a little bit, and I also want to get your take on this. There's been a lot of speculation that because you are more in the DeSantis camp for 2024, the Trump team, whereas they've helped out a lot of other folks that are swept up in lawsuits, that they are not necessarily helping you out because they don't feel you're loyal. Can you speak to that? Well, so far, uh, President Trump and the campaign have not given me uh, anything for my legal defense. I have also not personally uh, asked him. I have not asked the campaign, but I did ask them previously when I was facing uh, bar complaints. And this, of course, was uh, from the 65 Project, a Democrat-funded uh, organization uh, that tried to attack me and over 100 other uh, Trump attorneys because uh, we represented Donald Trump. And they said openly that their intention was to destroy our livelihood and our our credibility. And I've had no help or support uh, through that financially. I don't know what, if any, uh, he has given or the campaign has given to other attorneys or other people who have been attacked through this. Um, but what I can say is that my defense of uh, Donald Trump as an attorney, my duty of loyalty under the professional responsibility rules um, do does not change and still hasn't changed even as a former client, given that I am also a voter in this country and I have the opportunity and the responsibility to use my vote for the candidate of my choice. And even though I support Governor DeSantis, uh, that shouldn't in any way interfere, uh, not only with uh, my duty of loyalty to my former client, but also, um, I believe, his understanding of my loyalty to him as an attorney. Right. And there's that whole legal side of everything that you perfectly outlined. I mean, lawyers don't necessarily have to agree with their clients. They have to defend them to the best of their ability. That's your duty. You know, that's the oath that you stand for and that you've taken in that kind of profession. But then there's the more personal side of all of that. And, you know, I follow you on Twitter. I've seen a lot of your tweets. I know it hasn't been an easy time for you. But uh, like me, you have been attacked and raked over the coals because you have seemingly been more in the DeSantis camp or you have talked about DeSantis maybe having a better chance of winning a general election. So tell me how that feels personally, knowing that you've put it all out on the line for your former client and former president Donald Trump to now see Trump supporters, even some within the Trump fold, come out and attack you. That can't be easy. No, it's not. And I really respect and appreciate what you have also said, uh, Tommy, and I follow you as well. And I know that you've gotten attacked. And this whole idea that we owe a duty of loyalty to any politician, uh, regardless of when they are running for office or what they may have done in the past, is, I think, absolutely fundamentally antithetical to our responsibility as conservatives and American citizens to make sure that we exercise our vote in the best way possible. This is a primary right now. We all have an obligation as conservatives to look at the field of candidates, ask questions, and also support the truth here. And what I've been so disappointed from the Trump campaign is seeing how they're attacking Governor DeSantis with a false information uh, false clips, and all of these really vile smears against anyone who even supports him. And that's really when I started engaging, just standing up and defending the truth to say we can all disagree on who may be the best candidate, but we should do so with a modicum of respect and also fundamentally with conservative principles standing for the truth. And I will always stand for the truth. Yeah, I will as well. And, you know, it's it's a difficult line to walk. Uh, both of us know that very well. I mean, 
I have been a Trump supporter for many years. You have obviously been and the Trump team for many years, right? I fiercely fought for him 2016, of course, in 2020 through his entire presidency. And then I saw kind of the writing on the wall and I said, hey, it might be time to move on here because we need to get somebody in office that can, first of all, win the office and somebody that maybe has a fresh outlook that isn't focused on years gone by, but maybe focused more on the future and the American people. That's when I started to shift. It doesn't mean that I don't like Donald Trump. It doesn't mean that I don't like his policies or I don't think his presidency was fantastic. It just means I see an alternative that I think is maybe a better shot at getting us back in the White House. You put out a tweet, and I have the tweet the other day, in response to the flack DeSantis was getting for the listless vessels comment. So in my first segment, I talked about that comment. I think it was completely taken out of context. And when I listened to him say the listless vessels, I didn't take it as him calling Trump supporters listless vessels or deplorables, as Hillary Clinton has done. I took it as him saying something that's very true, that we cannot exist as a movement if our movement is around one person person and one person only, because eventually we're going to need to move on. So what does that mean if it's just around Donald Trump and only Donald Trump? So take me through your thoughts on that listless vessel comment. And do you think he's going to be able to get around that now that they're really weaponizing that against him? Well, it's really unfortunate that it's been taken so out of context, because clearly, if you listen to the entire clip of what Governor DeSantis was responding to, he was saying that we have to be principled and we can't simply support one person over our American values. And so we can't support a movement. I mean, listen, before 2016, those of us who were conservatives didn't even know Donald Trump as a politician. So the conservative movement and conservative foundational fundamental truths that I believe are rooted in the biblical principles from the word of God that's reflected in our founding documents in this country existed well before any politician of our current era and will exist into the future after any politician's administration or campaign is over with. And that's what Governor DeSantis was saying. And that's what I agree with. And what is so ironic here, Tommy, is that the Trump campaign and the MAGA movement in general, not everyone, but overall, these people who are taking this and comparing the listless vessels comments to Hillary Clinton's deplorables, I think are purposefully manipulating that when they themselves are openly on social media, calling me a porn star, calling me names that I would not even repeat uh, in companies such as this. Uh, they have made uh, me into you know this this model of here is an example of what happens if you don't have sufficient loyalty to Donald Trump that you're willing to unfairly and falsely smear Governor DeSantis. And I am principled, so I'm not willing to do that. So I think it's ironic that these people are taking this term listless vessel right. and making it out to be such a terrible uh, insult to them when they're the ones that have been openly and I think unfairly and very in an ugly way, perpetuating those stereotypes and attacking specifically women that simply support the U.S. Constitution, support the truth, and are constitutional conservatives and principled over and above any particular candidate, including Donald Trump and including Governor DeSantis. Yeah, I mean, every time that I say anything even somewhat negative or somewhat positive about DeSantis, somewhat negative about Donald Trump, I trend on Twitter because they hate me for it. And I can't help but remember, I know that you're in the same boat as me, I can't help but remember in 2015 and 2016, a group of never Trumpers having a lot of the same things to say about me that now Trump supporters have to say about me in 2023. So it's interesting to me how the tables have turned there because I was endlessly mocked for supporting Trump in those days. And now I'm being endlessly mocked for maybe supporting somebody else headed into 2024. Very interesting. But I've said this before, and I'm curious your take on it. I feel like Trump supporters on social media are very different than Trump supporters in real life. I think the bulk of Trump's base are those forgotten Americans, those hardworking blue collar folks out there who love what he did for the country, want to put America first, want to focus on the priorities of the American people. And then you have that almost cult-like element that exists on Twitter, and I believe Twitter alone, that I don't think they represent the true Make America Great Again base, the Donald Trump base. Do you see a difference there? 
No, I think you're completely spot on. And I think there are really great American conservatives that do love and support Donald Trump. And they're appreciative, like me, of what he did in his first administration. Uh, like you, I defended him from 2016 uh, through his, uh, his first four years. And it may be only his first four years. He may have another term. And if he is uh, the nominee and if he ultimately wins back the White House, I will support him and I will champion him in that. But we need to be able to have those conversations and ask those questions of whether or not he is the best conservative candidate. And it is ironic that you and I, who have remained principled and our loyalty is to America, to the Constitution and to the principles of conservatism, that we're now getting attacked from both sides because we won't either love or hate Donald Trump when that is the most popular thing to do. But I don't go along with whatever the popularity contest is, whatever the polls say. I'm principled, and that means that the truth doesn't change. And so my principles aren't going to change. But I do think there are a lot of great people still in the MAGA movement that need to sincerely address these questions. But I do also think, Tommy, that there are a lot of people, not only within the Trump campaign, but also in conservative media generally, that are buying into this false proposition that loyalty and access to Donald Trump means that they have to smear and malign and be anti-Governor DeSantis. And I think that's a losing proposition for their credibility, ultimately. And I really hate to see some of these uh, journalists and some of these other media influencers, specifically on Twitter, uh, falling for that and being unwilling to stand firm and say, no, I love and support Donald Trump. I'm willing to criticize him when criticism is due. I love and support Governor DeSantis, mm -hmm. willing to criticize him when criticism is due. That's being principled. I agree with you wholeheartedly. So I want to go through some kind of rapid fire style questions just so that we can keep it a little concise because I have a few things I really want to get your opinion on. Uh, number one, Donald Trump has recently suggested that not only is he not going to show up to the debate on Wednesday, he doesn't plan to show up to debate, plural, because he's leading. He feels that his record speaks for itself. Is that a mistake for Donald Trump to say he's not going to show up to debate this one or maybe any debates in the future? Absolutely, it's a mistake. He needs to come and be on that debate stage and answer for his record. And even uh, I agree with exactly what you said as well on Twitter, that he needs to answer the questions about personnel, about COVID response, about so many other things. He had four years in office, and so he needs to come and defend that record. Yeah, the last seven months are what I really would like to see him be questioned on. I think he's afraid that Governor Ron DeSantis is going to nail him on those points. So I think that's why he's choosing not to show up for this one and maybe future debates. You can do all the sit downs you want, but unless you're facing your competitors, I don't think that's a fair shake for the American people, to be real honest with you. Uh, my next question for you is, do you think that Governor Ron DeSantis has a chance at being our nominee, given everything uh, that he's coming up against, given the, the large Trump base that seems immovable at this point? Is a Governor Ron DeSantis as the nominee, do you see that as a possibility? Absolutely, it's possible. Is it probable? I think it depends on whether you uh, look at the polls like Donald Trump would like you to, or whether you look at this time in 2015 and how then candidate Trump, no one other than I think Ann Coulter and a few other people were saying that he had a shot. So never say never. Uh, but I do wish that Governor DeSantis would go more on the offensive, that he would speak in talking points, and that his uh, comms apparatus around him would have a better handle on what the American people are genuinely concerned about. The fact that he's kind of ignoring the weaponization of government against Trump, I think, is a huge mistake for him because the American people see that. They're outraged by it. And I think this is a moment that he could really be a leader and call the nation together to pray and to uh, just show that he is the best candidate for president. And my last question for you is this. If Donald Trump is our nominee, which at this point it looks to be the likely outcome, do you think that he has a shot, given everything, given everything we know about, you know, the apparatus that is the Democrat uh, voting machine, and I'm not talking about physical machines, but just the apparatus they have behind them with the mail-in voting and the ballot harvesting and the early voting and the media and Hollywood, can Donald Trump win again in 2024? And if so, why would this be more likely in 2024 than what happened in 2020? 
I think that's the precise question that needs to be asked consistently and repeatedly of Donald Trump and of the campaign, because with that recent uh, poll that came out that uh, that 65 percent or more of registered likely voters in America have said they will not under any circumstances vote for Donald Trump. If that's even remotely accurate, then that signals that he wouldn't win a general election. This is why we need to, as Americans, confront these issues now while we can still select our candidate. We can love and respect Donald Trump for what he has done in his administration in the past. We can also, as Americans, take our responsibility seriously to make sure that we put up the very best champion for 2024. And I'm not convinced that Donald Trump can win a general election. And that's in part why I am very supportive of Governor DeSantis. But I want to hear the response to that exact question, Tommy, from the Trump campaign. No one has laid out a path of how he can reach 270. I want to hear that as a voter. Best of luck to you, your legal defense fund. Where can people find it so they can help you out with your fight? Thank you so much. And this is much bigger than me. So I appreciate the support. It's at givesendgo.com forward slash support Jenna. And it's also pinned on my Twitter, which is at Jenna Ellis ESQ. Thank you, Tommy. And so much respect to you for fighting this good fight and keeping principled through all of this. So thank you for your courage and your leadership in this as well. Thank you for your kind words. God bless you. And we'll all be behind you watching you fight. And we believe you're going to come out victorious. So God bless you, Jenna. Thank you. All right, the singer and songwriter behind the new pissed off American anthem, Oliver Anthony, is being trashed by the communist music industry and labeled as right wing. Really? It's time for final thoughts.